Cindy Kelly. It is September 11, 2018, and I have with me John Fox. I'd like him to start by saying his full name and spelling it. All right, my full name is John Fox, J-O-H-N-F-O-X. I've always been grateful that I had a short name. John, I know you've, you've had a, an illustrious career here, so I want you to start from the beginning, you know, when and where you were born and how you, you know, came to... Oh my gosh, I was born in Portland, Oregon, uh, October 1st, 1927. Uh, that's uh, not quite 91 years ago uh, as of today. Uh, and uh, I grew up uh, uh, in Portland and San Francisco, sort of uh, moving back and forth uh, depending on uh, who I was living with and in the family. My father died when I was four years old and uh, it was the Great Depression uh, at that time and my mother was struggling and so I lived with aunts and uncles here and there uh, over the years and uh, ended up uh, I was in San Francisco when World War II broke out and um, living with an aunt and uh, uh, uncle and uh, uh, my uncle had lost his job because it was uh, dependent on receiving metal material for his uh, construction related uh, projects. So he moved uh, back to Portland and uh, uh, so I graduated in, from high school in Portland in 1944. I finished uh, in December of 1944 just about the time the first fuel was being discharged from B reactor, though I didn't know that, uh, and uh, went to uh, Oregon State University. I completed a uh, master's degree in mechanical engineering there in um, early 1951, came to work at Hanford in April of 1951, uh, and worked uh, for about the first five years uh, in the uh, reactor areas, uh, dealing with uh, special irradiation tests and with the uh, graphite uh, uh, expansion and healing uh, issues, uh, keeping track of that. In uh, 1956, the fall of 1956, the uh, Hanford Laboratories organization unit was formed, uh, which was a combination of all the um, uh, environmental and biological uh, research and development work, instrument development work and so on, together with a new program of Atoms for Peace under the Eisenhower administration, uh, which was to uh, explore use of plutonium as a fuel for power reactors. And we built the uh, small uh, plutonium recycle test reactor in the 300 area, uh, which was a heavy water moderated and heavy water cooled uh, reactor of 70 megawatts capacity, but run, ran at uh, high temperature. So it used oxide, mixed oxide uh, of plutonium and uranium for fuel uh, as, as a, a prototype fuel testing uh, machine. And over the years, I, uh, the laboratory was, management was taken over by Battelle in 1965 when they began the program of shutting down the Hanford production plant. And I went into uh, a lot of other diverse fields of uh, management uh, uh, retired from Battelle in, at the end of 1992. Uh, after that I went into uh, public service, uh, um, uh, got on some city boards and uh, park board and planning commission, eventually the city council and uh, finally spent six years as mayor of the city and retired from that five years ago uh, uh, at uh, 
in 2013, I decided uh, I, would, I was old enough that I should no longer run for election. <laughs> and so here I am still surviving today. Uh, it was that time I uh, joined Burma uh, and uh, got in on the formation of the national park. So by 51, um, the Korean War had begun and we were full tilt into the hydrogen bomb and at least that was in the planning stages. Um, so what, were the, what was the mood at Hanford? What was going on? Um, well, there was rapid uh, expansion um, the, uh, of the plant. I came uh, at the time they were completing a sea pile. In fact, uh, one of my, when I first got a clearance, I was here three months before I got a clearance to actually work out on the plant. And they were stacking the graphite for sea pile and I was assigned graveyard shift to uh, keep track of the stacking and see that uh, things uh, uh, went in the right place and uh, nobody was spreading any contamination. So I can claim to have been inside one of the piles uh, and it's all cocooned now, <laughs> I laid to rest. But, uh, so, so, so were those done by hand? These are Heavy graphite blocks, right? Where, when they were being yes, stacked. the graphite blocks are several feet long and and uh, 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 a little over four inches square and, and so on. But the, they're uh, you know the alternate layers are stacked uh, di uh, differently uh, and uh, some have holes for the process tubes and some for the control rods, the vertical safety rods and and uh, so on, and they're all, uh, each one is, is uh, custom designed for the location in the pile, so they got to line up right, <laughs> or, or, the, or the control rod won't slide in. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, it's checked and double checked and triple checked uh, uh, during that uh, process. But, uh, uh, so in, uh, at that time, then the uh, uh, first three reactors, B, D, and F, uh, were all operating. B had been shut down for a period of time be, uh, because they had been fearful that uh, uh, they couldn't continue to operate it uh, 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 because of the swelling of the graphite. It became difficult to push the slugs through the top layers of tubes uh, and um, you can get yourself into real trouble with that sort of thing. The uh, DR and H reactors had already gone into operation and the C was the uh, uh, third of the uh, additional uh, reactors uh, there. Uh, following that uh, uh, completion of C and putting it into operation, they then embarked on a period of uh, they had a, the method of getting the uh, swelling uh, of the graphite under control was to change the atmosphere inside the reactor shield from helium to a combination of helium and carbon dioxide gas, uh, which allowed the graphite to heat to a higher temperature and uh, anneal out the swelling. Uh, so that enabled them to keep the, all the piles running. So then that turned into a project to increase the power level of the piles uh, <coughs> to see how far uh, they could increase the power level by pushing more water through it uh, and controlling the gas mixture and the uh, uh, water, water temperature uh, to uh, prevent boiling uh, in the, any of the central tubes. And uh, that led to a, a more complicated uh, analysis of the pattern of uh, 
loading the peripheral tubes of the reactor with uh, slightly enriched fuel to what they call flatten out or even out the power distribution uh, in the reactor because originally it would be at high power rate right in the center of the reactor in a more spherical pattern inside this cube. Uh, and so they found ways to distribute that out farther and then they could reach a total, a larger total power output with the uh, same water flow. And then they uh, embarked on a large project to put in more pumps and piping and increase the water flow. So by the end, uh, uh, later on in the years of the Cold War, uh, they were operating those uh, reactors at eight times the power level initially. The reactor originally intended to operate at 250 megawatts thermal was running at uh, close to 2,000 megawatts. Later they built uh, the K reactors in the late 50s that were rated at 3,000 megawatts each. And so the total of total of the eight uh, directly cooled reactors uh, was running at a, um, at a peak power level of uh, about 18,000 megawatts, although not necessarily running at full blast all at the same time, because they, you still need to shut down frequently to discharge the uh, f fuel. Was the reactor design of C uh, identical or similar to B, or was it different? Uh, the C was uh, um, I identical in in the reactor core itself. I think there may be some tweaks in in, in uh, certain uh, features in the uh, in it. There were more. Uh, there was m greater provision for some um, uh, what we call test holes on the side, on the south side of, of a C reactor the, um, uh, to put in special irradiations uh, uh, because there were increasing requests to radiate, for instance, graphite samples. Uh, one of the things uh, that came to light in the measurements we were taking in the uh, late 50, uh, well, mid 50s, uh, on the uh, on the profile of the of the graphite at the top in the top tube channel of the reactor to see if it was coming down. It, the annealing of the of the damage in the central part of the reactor resulted in the tubes being <laughs> bent into sort of an S shape at the top. But the significant thing was H pile, which was started up after they changed the gas composition, uh, never did expand. Uh, in fact, uh, I was the one that wrote, wrote the document that showed that from the beginning, H pile began to shrink. Uh, uh, in the middle, and uh, so that uh, caused us to do um, uh, more exploration of graphite uh, samples, irradiation of graphite samples at higher temperatures. And so that was one of the kinds of tests uh, uh, we did. We even had uh, one experiment uh, for the naval reactor program of putting in a, uh, a prototype control rod uh, for a submarine reactor uh, design. Uh, and that had to go in uh, one of the vertical safety rod channels. And that was uh, uh, an interesting experiment because it had monitoring uh, uh, lines, temperature and gas pressure and so on uh, with external monitors. And uh, it was, uh, it led to a very complicated removal process <laughs> on the top of the reactor to get 
chop it up into pieces and pull it out, pull it out into gas and chop it up into pieces and get it out. The control rod? Yeah, the, 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 the experimental control experimental. rod. Yeah, because you couldn't just lift the whole thing out of the, uh, you couldn't take things out of the reactor uh, uh, in one piece. You had, you always had to, uh, you had to have some casks that you, where you could pull them, uh, pull it out and chop it off and then pull the next section out and chop it off uh, and, and so on. It, was, it wasn't because any experiment you put in there, or, well, not any experiment, but any experiment which had temperature or pressure or monitoring uh, uh, devices, uh, you had to be able to dispose of them on the way out. Uh, the, to go back to the 300 area, you, ha you had a test reactor the 300 area that used heavy water? Reactor. There were other small reactors uh, uh, built, um, uh, uh, but the plutonium recycle test reactor was uh, uh, heavy water moderated and heavy water cooled. It had a number of innovations in design uh, uh, in it that uh, were, were clever. It was controlled, uh, the uh, the tank of heavy water moderator was built uh, like a ch chicken watering uh, device where you have a jar of water and a, 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 a saucer around it uh, uh, for the chickens to drink out of. Well, <laughs> the, the, way it, the way it worked was to, to start the reactor up you you filled the the chamber at the bottom, and then you put a gas pressure, helium gas pressure on it to force the water up into the moderator tank of the reactor, uh, called the calandria because it had aluminum uh, sleeves for the zirconium process tubes to go through, and. To scram the reactor, you just shut off the gas pressure and the water dropped out and didn't have any moderator anymore. That, that was the, uh, uh, a unique design. It's, I don't think it, anything like it's ever been thought of or used elsewhere. Uh, the, um, but the uh, primary cooling system of it uh, uh, was high pressure, high temperature water uh, as, as in a pressurized water reactor, except it was heavy water, and it used, but it had a zirconium clad fuel bundles uh, uh, similar to those in a power, uh, uh, light water power reactor. That ran for, that reactor started operation in, I think it was 1961, and ran for several years, but, uh, uh, and a experiment they ran uh, late in the game uh, for a um, high temperature molten core fuel, molten core ceramic fuel um, uh, uh, failed on them and uh, damaged the, uh, the reactor and uh, after that they shut it down. But then the after uh, following that, the FFTF, the sodium cooled fast reactor, was built in the 400 area. But there was also a low power uh, reactor called the uh, high temperature lattice test reactor uh, in the 300 area. The um, uh, that was used to, uh, I think, to support the design of the N reactor, because the N reactor had a high pressure, uh, high temperature water cooling system, so it could generate steam for the power plant uh, next door. The uh, the 
plutonium recycle test reactor was the only one which was in a uh, containment vessel. It was, uh, and that uh, reactor was uh, demolished uh, two or three years ago in the, in the cleanup of the 300 area. So just curious, do you know whether the um, first reactor built by the Soviets was a replica of the B reactor? I've heard that it was, but I don't know that for a fact my, Some myself. Some thought it might be a replica of your experimental reactor that you built on its side. The, the, three o, the, o, the um, uh, 305 reactor was used for uh, testing the uh, fuel slugs, I think a statistical sampling of the fuel slugs uh, going into the uh, 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 production reactors uh, for quality control and uh, assurance of purity and so on. I, I'm not uh, sure, but it was a you know a, a very low power uh, power reactor. So that probably wouldn't be it. It would have been the B reactor, not. Yeah, it, it was, uh, I don't, uh, I'm really not, never was, paid any attention to that reactor. Uh, so I don't know, I don't think it had a cooling system at, uh, uh, at all. I think they just brought it up to critical and, uh, uh, and took measurements of it to see if it was, if there was anything uh, uh, requiring Further withdrawal of the control rods uh, to let it to get it to go critical, but uh, I'm not sure. Um, I'm just curious. But but there, there but there was no um, big uh, water cooling system there for it. Like, like the if you you know if you look at the uh, photos of the uh, production reactor areas, you you see there's all these other buildings around for the uh, for the uh, water uh, uh, the water pumping and uh, retention basins and holding basins and reserve supply supply of water and so on. There was uh, none of that for the three. Yeah, 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 not yeah, not so. in the three hundred area because you would if you were going to take a, a reactor up to any appreciable power level, you'd uh, you'd need the uh, um, backup systems for it in case of an accident. In the case of the PRTR, uh, that was why it required a containment vessel, so, so that in case of an accident, uh, consequences would be uh, uh, contained. And none of the uh, production reactors, uh, uh, including the end reactor, had a, were in a containment vessel. But the end reactor did have, because of the high, high pressure, high temperature reactor, it had a, a sort of uh, confinement system, a, a low, uh, w would withstand a low pressure and contain the uh, consequences of a uh, piping, major piping rupture. Why was it called plutonium recycle test reactor? Was it, is, did I understand you said recycle? Uh, yeah, the idea was that uh, you could take uh, uh, pl uh, plutonium and, and uh, repeatedly reuse it, uh, the, the, uh, the nuclear fuel cycle for thermal reactors would would include reprocessing extraction of plutonium and then recycling it through uh, the next batch of fuel. Uh, the weakness uh, that emerged in that uh, approach uh, was that as you did that, you, you built up more plutonium 240 and 241, 242, uh, 
uh, in uh, doing that, and you got into issues with spontaneous fission in uh, the other isotopes and, and in handling the um, materials. Uh, but aside from that, when it came to the time of the Carter administration, Carter banned reprocessing of, uh, of, of fuel and that uh, killed the fast breeder program and, and uh, any further use of, of uh, plutonium. How was that decision received by um, folks like yourself working on these reactors? Uh, uh, well, not well, because when you go back to the original uh, premise uh, back in 1956 of uh, can't we use plutonium for some uh, peaceful purpose and uh, just as a pragmatic uh, consideration if you look at the uranium total uranium resource uh, in the world uh, and with the, the once through system we're using now you're, you're only extracting a, a tiny percentage of the available energy source if you would con could convert uh, a major f fraction of the U U-238 into plutonium and then generate energy with that. Y you know, you could multiply the total available energy uh, to civilization by 50 times or more, so depending on the efficiency of the process. So, I, you know, ultimately, uh, uh, I think that uh, mankind may be forced to turn to that uh, despite all uh, complications that might ensue and, and find ways to deal with those. I, I obviously, or you tell me that what was Carter's concern? Why did he stop reprocessing? I can't read Carter's mind. I, uh, 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 so, uh, I would gather, he, of course, he went through the uh, Navy nuclear program, uh, but uh, I think he was uh, uh, con concerned that it might lead to some uh, uh, disastrous accident in handling of plutonium or, or diversion of plutonium to uh, uh, sources that didn't care how they used it, which of course is still a concern. That, uh, but nowadays, you know, maybe maybe Savannah River will get the mixed oxide fuel plant <laughs> built and start to burn the uh, old weapons grade uh, plutonium in the TVA reactors. I don't know what will come of that. Uh, what I do know is that mixed oxide, plutonium uranium oxide fuel was made in the 308 building at Hanford in 1960. And uh, that building uh, made mixed oxide fuel and used it in the plutonium recycle reactor and uh, both have been demolished and cleaned up and all they got is a parking lot there now. But Savannah River has uh, a plant, the mix oxide. I mean, they've been doing this for. Well, I don't know whether they're going to continue that or not, whether they're going to get the appropriation to continue it. Right, right. That's interesting. They're having as much trouble with that as we are with the vitrification plant. <laughs> In terms of funding or, or technically? Uh, well, uh, it must be technical. I don't know what their I don't know what their technical issue is uh, there. Uh, uh, so it's uh, hard for, for hard for me to say. Uh, but but uh, uh, we're still getting funding for the vet plant. But our big uh, controversy here now with the vet plant is whether or not 
the State Department of Ecology will, will uh, permit uh, grouting of the low-level waste, uh, which uh, they do at Savannah River. Uh, they, um, they vitrify the high-level waste, but they grout the low-level waste. Here, the tripartite agreement among the uh, state of Washington, the EPA, and, and DOE uh, requires us to uh, vitrify everything. Uh, so uh, th there's, there's a st strong pressure now from uh, some quarters to, uh, to f uh, follow the practice at uh, Savannah River, uh, which would expedite the cleanup here and reduce the cost of it by reducing the uh, uh, quantity of, of waste that needs to be uh, vitrified and encapsulated that way. I don't know what's going to come of, of that. But I think you mentioned the reasons the state's objecting uh, uh, to going the Savannah River route there. The, uh, but the situation here with the waste is much more complicated than at Savannah River because of the fact that over the, over the decades here, we used five different reprocessing uh, technologies, whereas Savannah River only used one. And uh, that put, and, and of course we have, uh, quote, managed, unquote, the tank farm contents over the years to prevent overheating, to suppress the formation of hydrogen gas and, and uh, deal with other problems from the heat generation and the, and the changing chemistry uh, in, the, uh, in the tanks. Uh, the result is that uh, we have apparently something like 40 different chemical feed streams from the tank farms to handle in the vitrification plant, whereas Savannah River has used only one uh, reprocessing uh, practice. That's the Purex uh, process uh, using uh, TBP as the uh, extracting chemical. And whereas Hanford began with the bismuth phosphate process, which did not recover the uranium. It put all the uranium into the waste storage tank along with the uh, fission products. Then uh, they switched to the redox process, which used uh, hexone, uh, a, a, a chemical for extraction. It recovered the uranium separately as well. So it eliminated that issue. But then, uh, then along came the Purex process, and uh, we ultimately switched to that, and that used a different uh, hydrocarbon than hexone. Uh, then we went back and recovered the uranium that was, had been put in the tanks by the bismuth phosphate process, and recovered that uranium with yet another process. And then we went back and took uh, out the cesium and strontium. Cesium um, uh, and strontium are the two of the uh, uh, highest uh, quantity fission products. And they both have about a 30 year half-life, so they have a high rate of heat generation and they were causing some of the problems in managing the waste in the in the waste tanks so
there's five different chemical processes to do these different things. Uh, uh, and there's still some, apparently, some strontium and cesium in some of the, the tanks because I think there's some, still a, a little work uh, uh, needing to be done there. But uh, that, the strontium and cesium which uh, were extracted were safely encapsulated and have been in a water storage tank separately uh, for a number of years now. In fact, they've gone through a half-life or maybe maybe two. And uh, so there's now the prospect of taking them out of water storage and put into dry storage. So how, all of that means we've got a, a much more complicated situation to face and uh, uh, it's exacerbated by adoption early on of this so-called black cell design for the VIT plant, uh, which was uh, adapted from a, a British approach, which uh, says you, you, you build this thing so it's, um, you don't require any uh, uh, pumping and mixing and uh, things that require maintenance. You, everything's driven by uh, pulse pumps, uh, um, uh, pressurized uh, uh, by uh, hydraulic or pneumatic pressure to move things around through the, through the thing and you don't ever need to go into the plant to maintain it. Uh, well, <laughs> that, 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 you can never answer all the reliability uh, questions that get raised uh, from that. They've even gone to doing full-scale mock-up of those uh, uh, pumps out, out here in a building near the WSU campus. They wouldn't accept the uh, typical hydrodynamic uh, design of oh, we'll test it on such and such a scale and then it will scale up and no problem. But uh, 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 the, 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 every review that comes up then they say, oh no, we have to go to larger scale or eventually full scale. So the, the black cell design is still uh, keeps on raising questions about it. So we're spending uh, far more. We have more people working on cleanup than worked in full-scale production at Hanford uh, years later. Uh, so that's a, a consequence of, uh, of postponing doing things early on because the urgency was on production and we'll take care of the mess later on. Well, we, uh, we, we do have a complicated mess here that's, that's quite different than the situation at Los Alamos, which deals with plutonium contamination. But we have that plutonium contamination problem too from the plutonium finishing plant that they're still demolishing and that uh, uh, it's more similar to the situation at Rocky Flats or, uh, or Los Alamos. But uh, Oak Ridge has not had that uh, kind of problem uh, there because they, they haven't dealt with the the, the processes that we have here on the scale that we have here. On the black cell design, it, it was the, uh, we actually hired the I, I, FC, ICI, who was the British? B, BNFL, British Nuclear Fuels. Uh, uh, it was a competitive bid for the uh, design of the VIT plant and they came out up with that and said this would be the much less costly way to approach it. Uh, uh, from where I sit, uh, 
uh, I think that's not the case. They didn't want to build it like the Hanford Canyon buildings, uh, where where you could, where you were equipped uh, with the crane and the remote handling to change out uh, any of the vessels and the cells in the in the canyon building and so on. They said this is a simpler, cheaper way to do it, and it, and it was. Uh, Perhaps uh, to crassly state it, uh, that's what you get when you take the low bid. You get some something that you pay through the nose for later on. Well, earlier than that, when I, when in 1970, uh, when the FFTF project had started, and Battelle was the uh, PNNL, well PNL at that time. Was, didn't have national lab status. Uh, um, Battelle had a design for a sodium-cooled reactor that was more like a, a materials testing reactor, more along the lines of a uh, something type of reactor that it had at Idaho Falls. Um, uh, and Milt Shaw, who was the DOE manager of the of the fast breeder program at the time wanted a small a pilot plant uh, design as a prototype for the Clinton River uh, fast reactor that they were going to build near Oak Ridge, and uh, they got into a big dog fight over that, and and he took the contract away from Mattel and gave it to Westinghouse. Uh, and they split the, the lab at the time, and I had the choice of staying with Battelle or going with Westinghouse on the FFTF project. And I decided that uh, I had had enough of the nuclear business at that time, and uh, I wanted to get into a greater variety of things with Battelle. And, uh, uh, so I stayed with Patel and uh, and uh, got into other things, but we had an, uh, uh, a sort of analogous thing come up uh, uh, at one point uh, there when, in the days of the uh, mainframe computers, uh, uh, and we had a uh, Univac computer, and the Department of Energy went out for bids and they, uh, no, it was the other way around. We had an IBM computer. They went out for bids and uh, they got a low bid uh, from Univac for a computer and they took it. Well, then it turned out that none of the software programs would run for the for the IBM computer would run on the Univac operating system, and you had to go through. This is back in the days of COBOL programs and what have you. And uh, DOE said to the various contractors, uh, we were all complaining that well, you didn't factor in the cost of of converting to software, which is enormous. And they said, oh, well, you just have to absorb that in your operating budget, your, your uh, overhead budgets. <laughs> and so that doesn't count because the procurement is on goes up and so forth. And I said, this makes no sense. And, uh, you know, it just it means you have to drop something that you were going to do uh, to go, go through that. And, uh, all because of the DOE procurement rules. So, uh, tell us then what um, what was your work at Battelle? What what did you do then when you joined uh, at this watershed when Rest Westinghouse took over the? Oh, uh, I uh, first uh, inherited some remaining programs in the. Uh, uh, there was still work on radioisotopes and trying to uh, uh, find ways to uh, use some of the isotopes uh, for commercial use, but that has been a very disappointing uh, 
uh, area, be, again because of the cost of extracting anything from the from the waste uh, products and uh, finding a right application for it. Uh, there is a little a little local cottage industry on that. Uh, the ice rake company um, makes some little uh, capsules. Uh, and I'm forgetting what isotope they use for them, but they're, they're used for uh, treatment of pro prostate cancer. And uh, so they do a little uh, of that extraction still in the 325 building in the, in the 300 area. There, there's still a handful of buildings in the 300 area that are in use uh, by the lab. Uh, uh, and then uh, Battelle helped uh, in the late 1960s Exxon uh, diversified into the nuclear fuel business and built the nuclear fuel manufacturing plant uh, here uh, west of, the, of PNNL. Uh, which they later sold to uh, Siemens, who later sold it to uh, 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 the French firm. It was Arriva, but the French have, yeah. it's, they're using a different name now, I think, because the French, they sold that uh, electricity to France, or I don't, I, I don't know. Who owns it? Every, every few years it has a different name, but they're still making uh, the, the fuel that was started by, uh, by Exxon. And Battelle supported that and uh, under contract to Exxon initially, and some of the people uh, uh, who worked for Battelle transferred to uh, Exxon and later Siemens and uh, Riva. Uh, the, um, but then I got into um, uh, uh, a periphery of the environmental uh, activities in the uh, uh, 1970s, uh, and uh, I uh, and the computer. What passed for a computer group in the uh, in but in the lab because the computer system was centralized for the Hanford plant at that time, but uh, when many computers were introduced and later personal computers, then we got into uh, partly technical and partly political battles over uh, who could do what with a computer. Uh, <laughs> with <laughs> and, and, and we had uh, uh, the mainframe computers, we had the deck mini computers, we had uh, our typing pools went to using Wang computers for word processing, and uh, then the uh, uh, personal computers came along, and first the apples, which had, uh, and, and then the uh, um, Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, uh, the uh, accountants all went for that. Um, the, uh, when the Macintosh came out, some of the scientists went for that. Uh, and the word processing shifted. Plant standard word processing was uh, a word perfect, and, but Battelle in Columbus was standardizing on Microsoft Word, <laughs> and we and we had documents which wouldn't uh, uh, translate to others. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> uh, I went through several years of of, of that, uh, uh, and of course uh, now it's a, it's a whole different world with uh, with uh, technology. But uh, so that's where I ended up in the uh, uh, in '92. I was I was uh, in the internal services group trying to 
uh, referee and, uh, <laughs> and, and support all the, all these different things. Get rid of, manage to get rid of the weighing computers first, at least. So do you do you, um, I've forgotten what we finally agreed on it. You wanted to talk about it in terms of the environmental legacy. Uh, yes, well, uh, the other thing, is, uh, yeah, that I wanted to say was uh, from, the, from the start, I think um, Leslie Groves uh, was immediately aware of the uh, status of the salmon runs in the Columbia River. And uh, one of the first things that was done was to contact the University of Washington. Uh, uh, to uh, uh, get support from them in doing this, and they uh, uh, so they set up early on uh, a a research program on that topic, which uh, uh, and I don't know the timing of, of this, but uh, at each of the original reactor areas, there was a. I think a 108 building that was uh, 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 near the reactor building. And I'm not sure what the function was supposed to be for those buildings uh, because when I came, the 108 building at B reactor had the uh, tritium processing uh, facilities. It was a, under what they called the P10 program uh, and B reactor and I think F reactor were producing tritium uh, and it was processed in two, uh, extracted uh, in two lines uh, uh, at the 108B building. At F reactor, they used that building for the uh, biological uh, lab and, and fish labs. Uh, so they built fish tanks there and uh, 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 I, I can't describe the history of that, uh, although I had, uh, do have a, um, somewhere a presentation that Bill Bear gave on that five years ago on the history of that program. So that, that was one aspect of that because there was a concern about both the, the temperature and the radio isotopes that could uh, go, particularly in the case of, of uh, ruptured slugs or an, or an accident at, at uh, one of the reactors. Um, there was, of course, the worker exposure and, and so on. So a, a, a very uh, uh, pointed uh, thing in the agreement between but uh, uh, Manhattan Project, Corps of Engineers, and DuPont was an instrumentation program to develop instruments uh, to measure uh, radioactivity at high, very high levels, which were, which they hadn't dealt with ever before, but at, at low levels uh, uh, as well in a range a range of circumstances because they didn't uh, have a, a grasp of how to, uh, how to measure and how to set limits uh, on, uh, on exposure. Um, they also recruited Herb Parker from the Swedish hospital in uh, Seattle uh, to lay out a program of, uh, of uh, worker protection, radiation monitoring, and uh, uh, so on for the Hanford production plant. And I think he, uh, and he could find this history out from the Herb Parker Foundation people uh, that uh, I think he first went, may have gone to Chicago to work on uh, planning this program. And um, uh, then lay it out. So at the, 
and of course, I'm, I'm not sure how they maintained any real secrecy on this point in, uh, uh, in the uh, wartime days because they uh, needed to, uh, uh, you, you know, you wore film badges that they read out periodically and they had uh, ionization pencils. Uh, uh, they always wore a pair of those. Uh, they set up a, a, a program of uh, where if you had to go into what was uh, uh, a high radiation zone, for instance, you know, every month, uh, say, uh, you had to go on the back face of the reactor and you had to open up all the uh, tubes that were going to be discharged in there, so you were in a, a high radiation zone there, moderately high. And so you had to determine, well, how long could a person be in there under, under the circumstances, and you had a, usually had a radiation, I used to call them HI, um, and the Health Instrument Organization was what was called in the early days. Um, later, they changed it to radiation monitor. Um, you and and you typically had to get a, uh, a a permit form, which was called a special work permit, to enter a certain kind of radiation zone uh, of known or unknown, little uh, known risk, and uh, uh, it was strip down to your underclothing and put on suits and tape up the seams and maybe wear masks or or uh, uh, or maybe have, maybe ha uh, even have an oxygen supply. I never did anything that required an oxygen supply, but I did go into uh, such situations when we were taking samples out of the reactor and 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 so on. Um, uh, the uh, and in the canyons, the original uh, bismuth phosphate uh, process they had designed into the system uh, through the um, f for each of the cells a a piping that was built into the the <laughs> thick concrete floor. Uh, where you could siphon up a a sample of the radioactive uh, 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 fluid uh, and 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 take a a pipette or something, take a small sample of it into a cask. So you, people had to suit up and go out. Always, I think, always a pair and maybe a radiation monitor with them uh, and. Uh, enter the canyon building and uh, uh, go withdraw a sample to send to the lab to see if, they, if the extraction uh, process, the precipitation process, had really gotten enough plutonium out of it. They had, would get an estimate from the um, physicist at the reactor for this discharge batch of how much plutonium there should be. And they would take a sample of the precipitation step and see if that uh, had that uh, right amount. If not, they might have to repeat that precipitation process uh, an extra time or so on. Uh, later plant designs, that, was, uh, that wasn't necessary. They had a siphon system that uh, that uh, transported it out to the, the labs, but they had to have a lab in each uh, processing building. But those were ex examples of of uh, uh, some types of jobs that uh, uh, required special protection, special work permit, and so on. And at times, uh, uh, I, I always wondered, uh, for instance, if they had 
had to replace some equipment in the in one of the cells and hauled it off to uh, some storage cell or something. Uh, if they spilled anything on the floor of the canyon building, if they, if, if they couldn't go back in again, or, or how they how they uh, cleaned that cleaned that up to where they could go out and sample. But anyway, right, I'm not familiar with those operations, but uh, just it's the sort of example of, of uh, uh, how they went about worker protection and limiting exposure. And if you got if you hit your limit for exposure for the week or month, then you couldn't go on uh, that type of job until the next month or, or whatever. Or if you got overexposed, it might take away your expo exposure for a few months and then you had to, you had to be assigned to non-exposure jobs. But of course, uh, but just ordinarily when the reactor was running, for instance, you could you could go in, the, uh, uh, of course, the control room, or you could go in the front face area, uh, uh, and so on, without that type of, of uh, protection. And this was a policy that Groves established. This was, your, what you just described, um, was introduced during the Manhattan Project. Yeah, it had to be introduced, uh, sorry, but it was a learning curve uh, uh, type thing. They, they, they make a plan in anticipating what they would meet, but then, you know, the real world <laughs> presents the problems <laughs> that not quite what you anticipated and you have to improvise uh, around them. Uh, a lot of things they had to do, they had uh, uh, might have to uh, call help to the maintenance operation in the machine shop uh, to make some special tool to do something to uh, to get at something that uh, they hadn't anticipated. Uh, but uh, uh, but still, it's it's remarkable. Uh, if you look at the overall history of the plant operation, that uh, uh, everything worked uh, and th that uh, they had as uh, a few uh, really serious problems as they did have, compared to average industry, even. Uh, I suppose if you look at the attempts to vitrify the waste, it's complex as it is, I mean, we've tried you know, four or five different processes over the last how many years, not, not, you know, yeah. Uh, it's a struggle, and yet the, during the Manhattan Project, they were able to do this chemical separation plant with the bath process remotely operated, first time they used remote operations yes. anywhere. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, well, it's, it's just amazing that it all worked and enabled them to produce uh, uh, the product on that time scale, and uh, and and yet at the time, uh, there I think there was a lot of feeling of, of why is it taking so long? We need this to end the war, uh, 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 and uh, and there were uh, places. Uh, up front where uh, they might have been able to save some time or compress some time. But, uh, you know, the, the famous dispute, uh, at least famous within the industry, dispute between the uh, uh, Met Lab physicists and the uh, DuPont engineers over the reactor design and how many tubes to put in and uh, uh, what uh, uh, it turned out that the, the DuPont conservative design saved the day. Uh, but uh, going into it, each of them thought, well, we could save some time if we only built this. Uh, the, uh, you know, it, you can understand the different positions at, at the uh, at the time, uh, 
different approaches to things, but uh, uh, it was that, that urgency that uh, uh, that drove it. And now uh, there's the with something like the vitrification and the ultimate storage, we we still can't face as a society uh, where to put the vitrified product <laughs> after we vitrified it. <laughs> you know, still now now what do we do with it? We haven't ever faced up to that. Uh, uh, so. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, because there just isn't that urgency that uh, wartime uh, put on, put upon us. That was one of the themes that John Price had in a way that he saw patterns where, uh, like when the tunnel collapsed, people had known about the weaknesses there since 1980 or something. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't until it, you know, it's not until you uh, not until it becomes a crisis that you can uh, muster the support to do it. And I, from my experience uh, in public office, uh, uh, in in politics, it's that way. You, in order to uh, uh, muster enough support to do something, you uh, you sometimes have to let it uh, come to uh, a point of real concern. It's in, in when are we going to spend a few million dollars to fix this traffic problem? Well, uh, nobody wants to pay more taxes. Nobody wants to raise the, the gas tax, but you got to have a way to pay for it if you're going to fix it. Uh, uh, and uh, it just has to get to a certain point of intolerance <laughs> before people will, will say, okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do it. Uh, just to pass a bond issue for a school uh, uh, is, is, uh, is, is, is similar. So it's human nature. The, uh, uh, and of course, another aspect besides the worker protection of the environmental concern was the operation of the chemical processing plant. And, and uh, you notice in the, in the uh, guidebook we put out uh, this year that the um, uh, illustration uh, of the first atmospheric test at the tea plant was done while the tea plant was still under construction and it had they realized that when they knew that when they dissolved the um, cans off the uh, uranium and and the uh, dissolved the uranium up front that gases would be released and would carry uh, uh, radioactivity out of the plant and so they ran some atmospheric dispersion test with by burning fuel at the base of the stack. Uh, stack was one of the first things they completed so they could run these tests in advance to determine how high they needed to make the, the stack uh, and uh, how the um, uh, how it would uh, divert uh, spread uh, under uh, the various climate conditions uh, here uh, because we do have windy days uh, out in that desert uh, uh, and, and stagnation days. Uh, so uh, they built a uh, very tall uh, meteorology to uh, tower in the 200 areas to monitor that uh, during plant operations monitor the weather. So they had days when they would not dissolve uh, depending on the weather conditions. That was one control. But they put in a, 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 a complete monitoring situation. And they did a lot of aerial surveys uh, around uh, 
uh, the plant too, uh, I, I think, uh, ahead of time. So, um, when you mean aerial surveys, they actually aerial of, of the, of the um, uh, atmospheric conditions away, f away from the, the plant and so on. And took took uh, maybe they did some releases and then sampling uh, around. So the um, so the uh, the atmospheric monitoring and modeling uh, of of that was an early program as well as the uh, aquatic program for for the for the uh, fish. Uh, so the the uh, the entire uh, monitoring program of radiation of of the uh, of the river of the atmosphere and trying to model that and setting up the the biological program on what were the effects of uptake on, on the fish, but and also the animals the and birds the, you know the ducks the migratory birds. Uh, there once was a pond uh, near the 200 West area, and uh, so they had a lot of micro migratory birds. There was a herd of wild goats that roamed the plant when I came to work here, and there are coyotes and deer and elk and uh, uh, are roaming around, so they had to uh, uh, sample those for uptake, and so the whole ecosystem and uptake of of uh, materials into uh, uh, plants and animals uh, b became a, a monitoring program. Uh, the uh, and, w and when the processing plants were built is my understanding that initially they did not put particle filters at the uh, at the base of the stacks at T and so on, but they quickly discovered that they needed particle <laughs> filters there, and so that was an uh, installation. But they and they found uh, uh, you know because they're. Um, Equipment was being contaminated uh, uh, in that area, so that pro, uh, 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 that became a pretty comprehensive monitoring and analysis program. Uh, uh, the biological program uh, uh, led to uh, uh, developing. Uh, uh, miniature pigs that were about the same uh, body weight as humans as a surrogate for doing a radiation test on. I, I, I think that probably some of that work in retrospect would not be popular with, with uh, a lot of people today. Smoking dogs and the, uh, 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 they had a colony of, of uh, dogs trained to smoke uh, because with handling plutonium, particularly in a Cold War facility of the, of the plutonium finishing plant where the plutonium nitrate was converted to metal buttons to ship uh, uh, out, uh, the main hazard is alpha radiation from the plutonium and that's alpha radiation while uh, isn't uh, doesn't penetrate uh, 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 clothing or any material very well, but if you ingest it uh, by breathing or drinking or through a wound or or, or something, then it can be uh, very uh, 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 difficult to, to deal with. So uh, that was the uh, the the biological impact was being studied to, again to try to set limits on human exposure to various forms of radiation, uh, and that uh, the 
over the years has led to a more diverse range of applications that PNNL is, is still doing. It's enabled on the instrument side to, uh, to develop very sensitive inter instruments for detecting nuclear materials for at border stations or, or other places. Uh, it led to their uh, um, uh, molecular sciences laboratory uh, uh, for a variety of applications uh, for their uh, work on climate change and and uh, other factors. Uh, so it's uh, uh, it's still a cornerstone of uh, the laboratory programs here now. And one of the ones that I can't answer is why is it so difficult to prove that radiation causes specific health issues such as cancer? Well, you know, a lot, a lot of uh, uh, medicine, a lot of diagnosis is based on statistical evidence, epidemiology, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily necessarily prove cause and effect, but it is, uh, uh, I guess, statistically guilt by association or, or, or what, ha what have you. It's hard to, hard to prove conclusively, and probably a lot of lawyers have handled a lot of cases uh, that uh, deal with, do you, ha do you have evidence uh, here that conclusively proves, uh, proves that this health problem in this person was caused by that <laughs> or, or, or something. It isn't just radiation that is, is uh, uh, difficult to prove this, this conference. Uh, and so uh, some, I forget when it uh, first came to be, the initial premise in the wartime days was that uh, exposure to radiation uh, uh, must be tolerable up to a point by living creatures uh, because p creatures are exposed to a radiation from, from sunlight and, and so on and here and there radon and so on and you get more exposure if you live in Denver than if you live on, uh, on the, uh, at the sea level uh, and what have you. And so that was the premise. And then, the, and I forget the two individuals at Livermore Lab who, who promoted the linear ex, uh, back extrapolation from, from higher levels back to zero and said, you should base everything on this linear extrapolation. Um, and so that became the adopted thing. And as Wanda mentioned uh, last night at the Burma meeting, uh, this conference at the end of the month here is to re-examine the low-level data, uh, what they have on low-level uh, radiation to, uh, uh, to try to uh, re open that uh, uh, whether whether the uh, linear analysis or linear assumption is is really valid or not or not and I don't know what's what's the, the, the case I do know that uh, under the uh, uh, worker compensation program that for the nuclear sites that's set up uh, in collaboration with the Department of Labor, that uh, skin cancer, for instance, is considered a uh, uh, a possible product of exposure to radiation by the workers at the uh, at the nuclear processes, and uh, that Oak Ridge does an analysis to determine whether or not you have a had enough exposure that it's a plausible uh, uh, cause uh, 
uh, for uh, skin cancer, uh, and if if it's determined individual by individual that you uh, have had sufficient expo total exposure to radiation from your work experience that you are entitled to uh, some compensation uh, from that fund and for uh, 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 reimbursement or pay for uh, removal of skin cancers. Uh, and uh, but that is all the uh, I think guilt by association that isn't based on any definite proof uh, that uh, that's the case. Around here, you can probably you can probably debate it. There, I think uh, uh, a number of people here have had that have qualified for that. Uh, but we also have a lot of sun in the summertime, and uh, uh, and so a lot of people have <laughs> have uh, pre most of pre cancers. I only, I only, I only know of one individual uh, here that uh, uh, died of a, a melanoma, uh, consequences of a melanoma that he ignored, but I don't think he worked at Hanford. <laughs> but, uh, so uh, I, uh, I don't know what to say. I, I, it, it seems to me that uh, there is a real. Um, difference among people in susceptibility to one thing or another. I have hay fever and and some sensitivities to certain things, so I have a immune system that that reacts strongly to certain things that other people don't uh, have. I, I have uh, we have uh, one very close friend who whose family, Alzheimer's runs in the family, and she is, she is going through that now, and after following her sister and her mother. And uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's clearly uh, uh, hereditary in that family. Uh, so, and other things, I, I think I'm probably, I have long-standing heart problem, and, uh, I think that's uh, hereditary in my family. Um, so, cause, proof of <laughs> causes uh, a, a tough thing. And, but on the other hand, I think I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today were it not for the progress in heart treatment during my lifetime. And I think in the uh, next generation or two, that's going to, uh, we're going to learn enough more about the brain and to, to deal more productively with dementia and Alzheimer's and, uh, uh, and more about cancers to treat a, a wider variety of cancers. Although someone, uh, somewhere just recently I read that if you prolong life long enough, everybody will die of cancer. Even, even if you could live to 150, then you'd die of some form of cancer. There's well, anything else, especially I'm, I'm, if you've been thinking about something you'd like to say. I don't want to... Uh, yeah, I, uh, well... Uh, I, I don't like to be defensive about uh, uh, anything and everything that's ever been done or not done at Hanford. And of course I sort of decoupled from the production aspect at, at Hanford early on. I only worked five years in that and 
uh, and then uh, went into the lab because I was just interested in a broader spectrum of things in, <laughs> in my life. Uh, I didn't do, want to be a narrow specialist. Uh, um, but I understand people's fear of radiation because it is something that is not uh, discernible by the senses that humans have. Uh, it's, it's there, but you don't know it. And uh, so uh, uh, th th I can see uh, people who tend to be more fearful uh, uh, could, can even get paranoid about that, uh, whereas people who are uh, optimistic uh, 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 take the blasé approach uh, and, it, and it doesn't bother me until it hurts me in some way I can sense. Uh, uh, and it's just like a whole lot of other things in the spectrum of humans in, in their uh, reaction to things. Uh, uh, and, but I'm, I'm a pragmatist. Uh, I think we just need to find practical ways to, to uh, deal with it. Uh, and uh, if we have the understand it more thoroughly and can devise ways to uh, contain its effects and handle the materials, we could make uh, um, more productive use of, uh, of the handling radioactive materials and, and putting them to use. But you've got to be uh, about 100% <laughs> effective in doing that, uh, and that's uh, tough to achieve. It is. Very high standard. <laughs> yeah, ultra yeah. high standard. Yeah. But, you know, but it's no different than uh, in, in character than dealing with space explorations and the things we talk about doing in space, if we want to colonize Mars, which seems uh, 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 like an uh, ultra-ambitious and uh, um, not very compelling need <laughs> to me, but, uh, 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 but it's interesting.